There are hormones made of protein. Isn't that interesting? One of the uh, common ones that you've probably heard of is uh, insulin. Insulin and glucagon and other hormones are made of little proteins. These proteins are messengers, so they go throughout the body. And then <coughs> pro, uh, enzymes are actually proteins, by and large, most enzymes. So as you can see, protein is a very important part of life. Uh, <coughs> we need adequate amounts of protein to maintain protein balance. And we, we call it as nitrogen balance. Since protein has most of the nitrogen, the carbon, carbon, nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen, we measure the amount of nitrogen in and the amount of nitrogen out. And they, we find that the needs for nitrogen go up when there are times of stress. It says here, uh, repairing tissue or muscle building. People who have had uh, severe accidents, trauma, people who have had bad burns need extra protein. If you're doing a lot of bodybuilding, you may have slight increased uh, needs for protein. Uh, but it's not all that much. How much do we really need? Well, <coughs> the government tells us, the federal government, the U.S. government, says that we need 0.8 grams per kilogram per day. So 0.8 grams of protein for every uh, kilogram of body weight. Well, what does that turn up to? If you take someone who is 170 pounds, well, to, we, to turn pounds into kilograms, you divide by 2.2, and that ends up with 77.27 kilograms, or 77.3 if you want to round it. Multiply that times 0.8, and a 170 pound person would need 61.8 grams of protein a day. Now the nutritionists tell us that the average American gets 100 to 120 grams of protein a day. So we're actually getting more than we need, right? Meeting the standard is not going to take nearly as much as the average American is eating. So there it is, about 60 grams of uh, protein a day. How did we decide how much protein we need each day? Well, the scientists discovered protein with the nitrogen and started doing the balance and discovered these proteins, and they said, I wonder how much we need. Well, let's find some folks who are healthy and see how much they eat. And they found a group of miners, I think, who were, quotes, healthy, and they measured how much protein they ate and said, well, that must be a healthy amount. Well, it's been coming down ever since. So uh, what is the real? The real minimum was uh, figured out uh, in the 1950s. This is uh, William Rose. Uh, let's see, 1957 is when he published this in Nutrition Abstract and Reviews. This is the really the only study that has been done looking at protein needs and essential amino acids because this study is considered to be unethical. It was done on prisoners and their diet was so changed as to remove um, the uh, proteins one at a time. You see, Dr. Rose had been studying the proteins needs of animals. And for example, in mice and rats, he had discovered that there were certain essential amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks for proteins. These amino acids, some of them can be made by our bodies, but some cannot be made and they have to be eaten. The ones that have to be eaten are called essential. So that's relatively straightforward. So he had checked on the rats, and rats are easy, I guess. They live in cages, and you can feed them, and you give them chow, and you don't have to make too much chow, <laughs> just whatever you need. And they removed one amino acid at a time, very carefully. And then they looked for problems in the rats from deficiency of that amino acid. Well, once he had that all worked out, he said, well, I wonder what it is for humans. Where can we do that? 
and they found this prison population and did the very same studies. They gave them chow to eat, whatever the food was, but they made sure that they removed the amino acids one at a time. Uh, and then what some of them that were essential for rats, they could go to zero for us and there was no problem. So it's actually a different list for us than it is for the rats. So Dr. Rose was trying to figure this out. His studies uh, removed one amino acid at a time, and he also did nitrogen balance testing. Nitrogen in, nitrogen out. Now, nitrogen in is not hard. All you do is make everybody's plate the same, tell them to eat it, take the leftover plate, and test it, right? How much nitrogen is in it? Since you did the cooking together, then you know what the nitrogen in is. But how do you measure nitrogen out? Where can we lose nitrogen in our bodies? Well, <clears throat> uh, many people say, well, what about urine? There's a little bit of protein or nitrogen that goes out in the urine. That's correct. But there's a lot of it that comes out in the stool. Uh, from our intestine, the lining of the intestines with all its structure and proteins tends to slough or fall off about every five days. So there's always something new happening inside the gut and the protein falls out. But there's, if you're going to really do careful nitrogen balance studies, you have to catch every hair that falls out, every eyelash. When you spit, there's mucus. When your nose runs, there's mucus. You have to get it all, okay? And even when you're, how do we say this, catching all of that, then there's the skin cells that are falling off on a regular basis. So to really do this, you've got to kind of be in a zoot suit that catches everything, right? And then very carefully measure. So with the protein studies, when he took the balance and he began to remove the proteins down, 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 what's the very minimal amount? He found uh, some interesting things. The total protein requirements are about 20 grams for every 3,000 calories. Those are, that was the, kind of the original study. 20 grams of protein for every 3,000 calories. It wasn't related in Dr. Rose's studies to how tall somebody was or how big they were. Remember, this was all male prisoners, so we don't know about, for sure about the females, but this was the way it was for the males. 3,000 calories is about right for what somebody would be taking in a, a day if, for a male who's moderately active. So about 20 grams of protein a day. That's quite a bit less than the 60 we talked about earlier, isn't it? So it's about to one-third. Now, notice on this one here, it says he set the recommendations for each amino acid at two times the highest measured minimum. When he found somebody, one of his prisoners, who began to have a side effect from removing the protein, he said, okay, they got it at that level, we're going to double that, and that's going to be the minimum. So that's how the minimums were arrived at. And you're going to see some slides that have minimums on them here in a bit, so you'll know where those came from. So carefully worked out, it's the only thing we have, and modern studies on humans will not be done because they're considered to be unethical. I'm thankful for what we know. I am sorry for the, what the, the people went through who had the studies dumb, done on them. The World Health Organization does not say how many grams per kilogram. They simply say every man, woman, and child needs 37 grams of protein a day. So now we've got kind of a range. 60 grams is what the federal government says for kind of the average male. The World Health Organization, 37, so that's pretty close to 40. And then Dr. Rose came in at the real minimum was down at 20. Okay, so now you have kind of an idea about what our needs are. Okay. Here is a statement from uh, a PhD nutritionist by the name of Mark Messina. The book, The Simple Soybean and Your Health. He uh, wrote it, published it. Uh, I think both he and his wife, they often work together on these things. 1994, he makes this statement. 
When people eat several servings of grains, beans, and vegetables throughout the day and get enough calories, it is virtually impossible to be deficient in protein. Now that's a pretty brazen statement, isn't it? It kind of goes against what you've heard or maybe even thought uh, in the past. I, I don't want you to just take it for granted. What I'd like to do is to show you the evidence that that is the case. And what we'll look at is the types of proteins and how much protein there is in the food. Now, I, I guess I would like to go back to that previous slide and remind you of one thing I'd like you to keep in mind. You see here it says total protein is 20 grams per 3,000 calories. What percent of the calories is protein? 2.6%. We can round that off in our minds to about 2.5% of our calories from protein. Somewhere along in there is the basic minimum as Dr. Rose laid it out. Okay, there's Dr. Messina's statement. Let's uh, see what the data shows us here. Uh, here's for the requirement for protein for a 70 kilogram male. That's the prototypical kind of nutritional uh, body, if you will. The recommendation is 55 to 60, somewhere right around the 60 range for protein. Uh, this slide was made up as I was teaching there at the master's uh, graduate uh, program. We had a lot of people who were from international places, so we're looking at basic staples. How much protein is there in the basic carbohydrate staple? Well, if you take white rice, four cups, which is a reasonable whole day amount, you can see that it's a little over 20 grams of protein. Now, according to Dr. Rose, would that be enough? Yes, if it volume-wise, it probably is. It doesn't meet the, the uh, federal standard of the 0.8 grams per kilogram or up to around 60. The next one is 17 corn tortillas. Those might be eaten in Mexico, right? And you can see that that's a little bit higher, getting a little closer to 23 or 24. Uh, uh, and this is actually grams of protein. Then we have corn mesa flour, and that goes up higher. And this one's kind of fun. 14 slices of French bread. So this is highly refined white bread. That has about 30 grams of uh, protein. You wouldn't expect white bread to have protein in it, would you? But it does. The grain it was made from used to be alive. Anything that's alive has to have protein. Whole wheat bread, 6.2 slices, has uh, a little over 20 grams. And you'll see that 6.2 come back again. That's a, kind of an odd one. Well, who would eat 6.2 slices of bread? But there's a reason for that. And then there's the kilogram potato. Now, if I lived in Ireland, I suppose it's probably not one huge kilogram potato. I mean, that's 2.2 pounds. But it's probably several potatoes, and that would kind of be my starch for the day if I lived in a place that lived on potatoes. And eat potatoes, you don't think it's being a high-protein food. You can see it comes in just a little bit short at about uh, 19, somewhere along in there, grams of protein. So that gives you a feel of the basic staples, carbohydrate staples around the world, and what happens with them. Now, look at here. Here's the food on the left-hand side, and then we'll look at the percent calories from protein. Now, Dr. Rose said the basic percentage was what? 2.6%. So that's kind of what we'll look at and see how we come out. Uh, the food, the first food I have here is rice. Rice? Do you think of rice as a protein food? No. 8% of the calories are from protein. Interesting. Why, that's almost three times what the basic requirement was for as far as Dr. Rose's study. Oranges? Now, I'll bet you never thought of oranges as a protein food, but it's alive. It grows on a tree. It has enzymes. It has structure. And indeed, <coughs> oranges are 8% 8 per 8 of the calories are from protein. Potatoes, 11%. Are you impressed? Yes, sir. Yes, and what I've done is pulled out the white potato here to kind of match the slide. So yes, and everything is different. We're kind of in range here. Sweet potatoes should be 
They may be. I don't know because I, I don't remember looking it up. They vary. Sometimes we're surprised, you know, at, because we would expect, but it may not be. Here's uh, beans, and there's some variation within the beans, but beans are at about 26% of the calories from protein. That is, in essence, the same as it is from muscle or beef, fish, chicken. The muscle all comes out about the same as the beans. Now, it's 26% of the calories in beef. What's the other 75% in beef? Fat. In beans, what's the other 75%? It's carbohydrates, fibers, and those types of things. So, so yes, the protein is about the same, but the health effect is, is uh, significantly different. Now, this is, uh, gives you a spread and shows that there's plenty of protein in plants, beans especially. You take, a, what, a quarter, half a cup of uh, kidney beans, and you've got about the same amount of protein as in a three ounce steak. So you don't really have to worry about it from that standpoint. When in our lives are we growing the fastest? When do we need the most protein? When we're young. When we're pregnant. Pregnant, that would be another good time. I'm thinking of that first because you know that first six months of life when we double our weight beats pregnancy hands down okay you hope you don't double your weight when you get pregnant right <laughs> okay so there's that child doubling the weight in about six to eight months what is the food designed for a baby to double its weight in six to eight months breast milk right what do you think the percent calories from protein is in breast milk now this is kind of the big surprise. When I saw it, I said, it can't be. Really? Five percent. <laughs> we really don't need that much protein. There are other things that are much more important. So if you're worried about getting enough, get it from beans. Get some beans. And the truth is, there's adequate amounts in rice, oranges, potatoes as well. Uh, breast milk comes in at twice what Dr. Rose found is the minimum, right? And, and the child can still double the weight. I thought that was pretty impressive evidence. Any questions or comments on that? Does it make sense? Speechless. No? Oh. Okay. Went to sleep. Let, yes? Is it harder for our bodies to process the fat and the protein through, compared to beans? <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I imagine it depends on who you talk to. The truth is the fat that's in the beef makes the stuff stay in our stomach longer. Okay? And it, there's a lot of saturated fat in there, which tends to be hard on our arteries. So from that standpoint, I would say beans are a lot better. But there are some people who find that when they eat a lot of beans, they have something that we call flatus or gas. And they might say that beans are harder on their system, okay? And then <clears throat> there are some who eat a lot of beef and no beans who have a real hard time with constipation, okay? So maybe beans are better from that standpoint because the fiber really helps. So let's say there's kind of positives and negatives. Overall, in my mind, the plant proteins are much better. But we still have to talk about quality. That's kind of what's coming next. Yes? Oh. I, what I don't understand is that you're saying 5% of the breast milk... Of calories. 5% of the calories. Okay, calories is protein. And yet, the protein is very important for formation and growth, isn't it? And those are the, you know, the first six months. It's very important. So... The, and it works! <laughs> The first six months, that breast milk at 5% protein works. It works. And why are we worried? Because we're not getting 25% or, right? I can't get my beef. It's got 25% protein. I won't have enough protein. Well, wait a minute. You could have much less than that. You know, one-sixth of that. Is it one-fifth? 
one fifth of that, and and still have enough. Combine. Okay. Now you've moved us, this whole business of combining to get adequate proteins is where we go when we talk about quality protein. That's exactly what we need to deal with. What is the quality of a protein? What's a high quality protein? And, and that's a good segue. Let's move on to the next slide here. What I'd like to show you is looking at, uh, uh, to introduce you to protein quality is to share with you where the concept comes from and how it's done. What we have here is uh, on the top uh, is amino acids, that is how many of each of these essential amino acids, because when we're talking about getting adequate amounts, we're talking about the essential ones, the ones we can't make ourselves. We want to get adequate amounts of each one. Dr. Uh, Rose worked these all out, and uh, you can, you'll see at least a spattering of them here. We're going to have the food in this column. We're going to have how much protein in this column. And then we've got the amino acids, and these are divided up into groups. It's not all of them, but it gives you an idea. We have lysine. That's one of the essential. There's two sulfur amino acids. They're put together. It's fine. If you get one, your body can make the other one. If you get the other, your body can make the first one. They're, they're interchangeable as long as you get them. Threonine, and then tryptophan and leucine. So there are uh, some of the essential amino acids lined up for you. And then, let's see, next uh, row here, you have ideal, it, and this is from uh, Dr. Rose's studies. These are the grams of each of the amino acids that are needed according to Dr. Rose's standard. In a 24-hour period, you need to have this much of this essential amino acid. Does that make sense? So that's that standard right across there. 5.5 of lysine, 3.5 of the sulfur amino acids, 4 of threonine, 1 of tryptophan, 7 of leucine. So that's ideal. And then what we say is, as long as there is at least that much in 100 grams of the food, 100 grams of whatever the food is, then it's called a high-quality protein. If one of those amino acids gets low, is lower than that, in 100 grams of food, 100 grams of food is about the same palm size, about three ounce steak would be about uh, your 100 grams, somewhere like, something like that. So here's egg, 12.8% uh, uh, protein. We have uh, lysine, that's more than 5.5. The, uh, uh, the, uh, the 6.4 is greater than the 5.5. On the sulfur, the 5.5 is greater than the 3.5, the 5 is greater than the 4, 1.6, all the way down the line. And we would say, that's a good quality protein. What about milk? Yes, milk does fine too. What about beef? Oh yeah, beef is a good quality protein. What about chicken? Oh yeah, chicken is a good quality protein. They're all about the same, it's all muscle, right? Maybe a little variation, but they're pretty close to being the same. Wow. <clears throat> now, next on the slide here is the green line. <laughs> I'm going to cross over the green line, and we're going to look at the soybean. Now, here's the soybean. You've got 6.9 of lysine. Is that over 5.5? Yes. Now, when we get to the sulfur amino acids, we've got 3.4. And this one is 3.5. Uh-oh, this one falls short. The rest of them are okay, but this one falls short. Now, remember, this is how much many, or how much, of the essential amino acids is in 100 grams of food. But does anybody eat only 100 grams of anything during the day? Absolutely not. Notice that all you have to do is increase the serving size to about 110 grams, and all of a sudden, all the essential amino acids are in the soybean. It's very serving size dependent. It's based on an animal model construct, and it has no use in humans. We still hear it from nutritionists and doctors, but the PhD nutritionists all understand that it's a big joke. It just doesn't work this way. 
It's so serving size dependent. All you have to do is increase your soybean from the 100 grams to 110 or 120 grams, and you're covered. So you ask about the mixing. You don't even have to mix. Now, if we go through this, you will see that we have, uh, we have the soybean and the black beans, and they're fairly similar, although the, they're a little lowered in sulfur amino acids than the soybean. The soybean is one of the, uh, the closest to animal protein. Lentils, uh, uh, less of the sulfur amino acids, and then tryptophan drops a little low. Uh, cornmeal uh, has a whole different pattern. And, and you can understand where this mixing idea came from. If you put cornmeal together with soybeans, oh, it's good. But, you, you know, 50 grams of each to make 100 grams, and then you'd be okay. It, it, nobody does that. We don't eat that way. We eat a whole meal. And as our volumes go up over 100 grams, the essential, you know, essential part becomes of really uh, insignificance. Oatmeal, and you can see it has a little different pattern again on the essential amino acids. So you can tell that we can get the essential amino acids from simple foods like, <laughs> I don't have potatoes on there, but certainly soybeans can provide all you need, lentils, and the truth is the same thing can happen from potatoes and other things as well. Now, what I'm going to do is to take you through all the essential amino acids. I'm going to show you a graph of each one. Here's the requirement for a 70 kilogram male in one day. Here's how much in uh, four cups of white rice, 14 slices of French bread, 6.2 slices of whole wheat bread, and that kilogram potato. That is one big baked potato. <laughs> okay? So let's see what happens. We have phenylalanine and tyrosine. These can be interchanged. If you have one, you can make the other, so they're very closely related. You have methionine and cysteine. You have leucine. You have lysine. On each one, this amount of food meets each essential amino acid need. There's threonine, tryptophan, valine, isoleucine, and here they all are together. So here's the requirements, each one with its color, just like we saw from here to here. Uh, those are the requirements. If you have two slices of whole wheat bread, you come up short. If you increase to 6.2 slices of whole wheat bread per day, you get all the essential amino acids you need. Now you know why that 6.2 is important, okay? Because you wouldn't think that whole wheat would be a good protein source, right? But the truth is, it is, and it gives you all your essential amino acids. Don't look at me like that. Ask a question. <laughs> Does it make Why sense? Do they talk so badly against white bread, then? Well, white bread is bad for another problem, okay? White bread acts like sugar, sugar, just plain sugar, and it drives your sugar up, drives your insulin up, increases inflammation in the body. But it, it's, it could provide the protein for you. That's true. Life is more than simply a simple single food. Since that white bread is a common food, it was a good one to choose as an illustration. You didn't think it had any protein in it at all, did you? So, surprise. Yes? Six slices of whole wheat bread? Yeah. You think that's too many? Okay. <clears throat> that, that, that would be three peanut butter and jelly sandwiches plus the crust, right? Okay. <laughs> I understand uh, where bread is a staple, that's a reasonable daily dose, right? You'd have a couple slices with each meal. So that would, that would fit, I think, fairly reasonably. Well, and we mix things up. We have potatoes, and we have some bread, and we have some corn, and we have some beans, and we have some... I mean, there's, you mix it up, and when you mix it up, it's there. You don't have to worry about the protein. And you don't have to worry about the essential amino acids. If you're getting enough calories, as Dr. Messina said, if you're eating, getting enough calories, you are going to have enough protein. That's the way plants are made. They have to, protein is necessary for life. Plants have to have it for life. And when you eat the plant, you get the protein that's in the plant. Is that whole true for fruit, too? 
That holds true for fruit, too. You remember that oranges have 8% of the calories from protein. And that, that is a, a fruit. It would be true for all of them, maybe in a little different uh, percentages. Yes, ma'am? Sure, nuts have some protein in them. Uh, fat tends to be the greatest thing in uh, nuts, but there's a good quality of protein. If they didn't have the fat, we would call it a protein source. Nuts have quite a bit of protein. Yes, ma'am? How do nuts fit in this? How do what? Nuts. How do nuts fit into this? That's just what she asked. The nuts I have uh, lots of protein in it and, uh, and do have, uh, of course, quite a bit of fat as well. Well... <clears throat> Can too much protein cause trouble? Boy, we've got some science about that. Right now, the federal government is recommending 0.8 grams per kilogram, or for the prototypical male, about 60 grams of protein a day. What happens when you drive it up too high? Can you cause trouble? Yes. Big question about kidney stones. What is the most common thing in kidney stones? Do you all know? Calcium, right? Calcium of some kind makes these kidney stones. And so we have this big question. If you've got kidney stones that are made of calcium, how do you stop from having kidney stones? Somebody who's had a kidney stone, what should I tell them dietary-wise uh, so they can avoid making these calcium stones? Well, the initial thought was calcium stones, then stop eating calcium, right? And then we began to get, and that's what we told people for years, then we began to get some evidence that a high protein diet, especially when it's animal protein, tends to increase the calcium in the urine. Maybe high protein is more likely to increase or to cause kidney stones. So maybe we should treat people by putting them on a low protein diet rather than a low calcium diet. Which is it? Well, the study was reported on, and I think it was 2002, yes, January, New England Journal of Medicine. And what they did was they put people who had kidney stones on randomly into one of two diets. They either got low calcium or low animal protein diet. That was the choice. When they got done, they found that those that on the low calcium diet had more stones than those on the low animal protein diet. You, they cut the stones in half, the number of stones in half, when they uh, m moved them to the low animal protein diet. Surprise! Uh, I think it's quite clear now. Here's a, I actually took this out of the uh, journal. Look at those kidney stones. Those who have had both tell me they would rather have a baby than a kidney stone. Okay? It's, it's, uh, they look like instruments of torture. Uh, they start in the kidneys, they go down the ureters. Uh, and the truth is they sit up there for oftentimes for a long time before they finally start to roll. They're made uh, up, up by the kidney. So here we see at zero, they had their first kidney stone. They were randomly assigned to one of the two diets. We see no difference between the number of kidney stones until about two years. Why is that? Because generally when a person has passed one kidney stone, they still have another one or two up there, which are likely to shake loose and come down. Then we begin to see the separation, and out at about five years, you see this dramatic drop of about 50% a decrease in the new stones. So 20% recurrence on low animal protein diet and 40% recurrence on the high animal protein diet. A 50% drop from 40 down to 20%. So now the answer if you have uh, calcium kidney stones dietary wise is low animal protein. Make sense? Now I'll tell you a little uh, additional information. Don't think that the best way to not have a kidney stone is to avoid eating animal protein. It's the second most important thing to do. The first most important thing to do is to drink lots of water. Because if you're well hydrated, you won't make kidney stones. You know, it's only when the urine gets really concentrated that this stuff crystallizes. Yes, ma'am. I've never seen any scientific evidence of that. Uh, I don't know that that will actually happen. 
It would uh, certainly help keep them from getting larger. A kidney stone tends not to cause pain until it plugs up the ureter. Once it plugs up, the pain comes from the pressure built up back. So if we can keep the stones small and they can go down the tube and get out without plugging things, we might not even notice that they're there. Yes, sir? What were you saying now about drinking water? Is it what? If you drink water, your urine is dilute. Kidney stones happen with concentrated urine. So if you have dilute urine, you won't have the calcium and other things like the oxalate crystallizing out. Okay. Some people are put on diets low in oxalate because they're calcium oxalate. But I think the hydration and the, uh, uh, the low protein are by far the more important ones. Yes, ma'am. No, the type of water you drink will have no effect by the time it gets to your kidney. It, the water in your blood is buffered very carefully by a whole bunch of systems. So, okay, here's another one. We've heard, you've probably seen it, as a matter of fact, that, uh, <coughs> and you've heard it, the exercise, the strength for exercise comes from my meat. You know, if I don't have my meat, I can't be a football player, I can't do track and field and those types of things. Well, the studies have shown differently. This particular study is done on uh, endurance athletes, those who do very well on a bicycle. And they are uh, placed on three diets and then exercised to exhaustion to see how long they can go until they just can't go anymore. Well, we find that those on the plant-based diet could go two hours and 47 minutes before they, on average, before they were exhausted. On a mixed diet, lower meat, fat, and protein, they were able to go an hour and 54 minutes. And then when you get to the high uh, protein, it was even shorter. So in the laboratory, when you feed people plants, they, ex they do actually do better. Uh, Dave Scott, does that mean, is that a name that means anything to any of you? I had his father as a patient. He was one of the top guys in triathlons. He ran, won it for years in the Hawaii uh, triathlon. And he's a 100% plant-based. That's what he does it on. So it's uh, actually the athletes do better on a plant-based diet. And there's biological reasons for that. Uh, this is from the book, A New Century Nutrition. Well-trained athletes improve their fitness levels 35% after switching from a meat diet to a plant-based diet. There's a significant improvement, and the plant-based diet is definitely uh, better. Let's turn to another area of uh, concern that where protein can cause trouble. When you get too much protein... The pH of your blood, you were talking about the water, and I think you were probably asking, if I get alkaline water, will it really help? It ends up that protein really acidifies our blood. So it overwhelms anything that your water could do. All, uh, too much protein, they're called amino acids, right? So they tend to make our body more acid. There's an increase in urea, which is a breakdown product, that acts as a diuretic, which pulls water out of the system. The blood is more acid, and because there's an acid, it needs to be buffered. Where does the buffer come from? The most common co uh, buffer is calcium carbonate, which is pulled from the bones. Does that sound good? No. That has a, there's a bit of a concern. Um, let's see, I think the next slide has a little more. As we get older, the, uh, the uh, filtration rate in the kidneys tends to go down. So uh, the, the older kidney is going to have a little harder time dealing with the protein. Otherwise, healthy individuals as they uh, age uh, tend to get a little more acidotic blood as part of the aging process, unless they counteract it with plants. And bone buffers the acid, releasing calcium. It has something to do with oste uh, osteoporosis. Acidic blood directly stimulates the osteoclasts. These are in the bone and they eat up the bone or tend to break the bone down. And it inhibits the osteoblasts which build bone back up. So 
this whole environment created by too many amino acids tends to cause or lead towards osteoporosis. Now, the plants give us an advantage, and let's explain that. The plants, while they have proteins or amino acids in them, also have a bunch of what we would call base precursors. This may get a little too complicated for some, and that's okay. <clears throat> Organic potassium salts, things like citrate, malate, and gluconate, these are acids, but when they come into our bodies, they take a hydrogen from our stomach, and then our body burns them up. It turns them into carbon dioxide and water. And in, that, in doing that, it decreases the number of hydrogen ions or decreases the acid. It actually, because our body can digest it, it turns the body alkaline. Plants have lots of these. Animals have none of them or almost none of them. So the, these organic acids in plants counteract the protein effect. That's why beans are so much better than beef, much less likely to have this uh, deleterious effect on our bones. So, does a high calcium diet protect your bones from loss? This is an old study. This was reported in 1974 in Eskimos. Eskimos who were over 40 years of age, <laughs> that's a lot of calcium. 2,500 milligrams of calcium a day. What's the recommendation for the postmenopausal woman? Do you know? 12 to 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day is the recommendation. These guys are taking 2,500 milligrams of calcium. Will it keep their bones strong? They have 10 to 15 percent more calcium loss from their bones than those of us who live a little further south. So taking the calcium doesn't do it. Maybe it has something to do with vitamin D, but the calcium does not do it. I think we can learn that from looking at these uh, Eskimos. They eat between 250 and 400 grams of protein a day. Wow. That's a lot. And that may have something to do with their calcium loss. This is not proof. It is simply a, uh, a, a correlation, something that was noticed early in our uh, questioning about the, these effects. Now, this is a little more practical sort of a study. It's not long-term. It's relatively short-term. Uh, the scientists did calcium balance studies. They wanted to know how much calcium stayed, how much we eat minus how much we lose. Right? Is it going to go positive or is it going to be negative? <laughs> so what they did was they have three diets. There's 142 grams of protein a day. This is animal protein. 95 grams a day and 48. Now, the recommendation from the federal government is closer to 60, so I suppose we could call this low. It's not really down at the bottom. It's not down to the World Health Organization 37, right? But so that's not unreasonable. It's not dangerous at all. Intermediate, and then 142, which would be high even for the average American. Now, we measure the uh, loss or gain of calcium when we give everybody, no matter what diet they're on, 1,400 milligrams of calcium a day. So that should be enough, shouldn't it? Remember the recommendation, 12 to 1,500. We're going to give 1,400 milligrams of calcium a day, and we're going to give the different protein diets. Let's see what happens. With the low-protein diet, there was an increase of 20 milligrams of calcium every day. With the intermediate protein, there was a loss of 30. And with the high protein, there was a loss of 70 milligrams of calcium a day. You see, a high protein diet may actually, well, it pulls the calcium out of your body. It's not how much calcium you eat, it's how much calcium you keep. We mentioned that for the postmenopausal woman, the calcium balance is maintained at a, when you get about 12 to 1500 milligrams of calcium in a day. For someone who is a complete vegetarian, we sometimes call them vegans, the same balance is gotten at, or reached at about 400 to 450 uh, milligrams a day. So the protein, the animal protein, tends to suck the calcium out. All the studies done on, and there have been a lot, on milk, and osteoporosis and calcium and those types of things have been very disappointing to the dairy industry. When they do show a positive effect, it is a very small effect. And there are many more studies that demonstrate 
that there is increase in fractures or osteoporosis. Recent studies in children found that it was fruits and vegetables that made their bones stronger, not the milk they drank. And that has something to do with how much calcium you keep. Okay, uh, here we're looking at uh, the ratio of animal to vegetable protein. This is taking a group of people from late teens up through the 50s and 60s. So relatively young when it comes to bones and actually looking at fracture risk related to how much animal and vegetable protein they take. Uh, those with, and, and you can see the numbers uh, line up here. If there's a low amount of animal protein, the fracture rate tends to be low. As the animal protein goes up, the fracture rate goes up. These are relative risks. And so not absolute risks, but there is a correlation that has been found in the literature. Well, can you get enough calcium from plants to have strong bones? Let's look. Uh, this gives you a bit of an idea of how much calcium is in a serving of these foods. You can see kale down here is about 179 milligrams. Oatmeal doesn't have that much. Lentils aren't that good. A dandelion greens do pretty good, don't they? and baked beans and sesame seeds. Uh, here's, this one brings in milk. Milk comes, whole milk comes in about 290. Non-fat skim comes at 301. It's higher because when they take the fat out, they put some protein back in. Uh, uh, and apparently a little calcium as well. So you, you kind of get a comparison. Lamb's quarters, anybody know what lamb's quarters are? Yeah, kind of a, it's a weed in the backyard, and if you haven't sprayed anything on it, it makes a great salad. I've never tasted it. I've only been told this. Carob flour, really good. Collard greens, look at that, 357. Calcium carbonate is the most plentiful substance on planet Earth. Uh, islands are made of this stuff. Uh, where does the cow get the calcium to put in the milk? <laughs> comes from the grass. Where does the elephant get the calcium to grow so big, or the giraffe. They're plant eaters. The largest mammals on the planet are plant eaters. And that even goes for the whales, because they eat the plankton. So this whole idea that you have to have cow's milk to get enough calcium is really uh, a figment of the Dairy Council's imagination. Yes, ma'am. She says, is calcium carbonate better than calcium citrate or calcium gluconate? I think that was kind of the question. Dr. Haney, who is kind of Dr. Calcium in the United States, he's the head calcium researcher, did a study that compared all the different calcium sources. And he said, calcium per dollar, calcium carbonate is by far better. More important than how much, than how easily the calcium is absorbed from the different ones, for example, is your vitamin D status. And you may remember we talked about vitamin D. If you have vitamin D, you'll double the amount of calcium that you are absorbing. And that's much more important. When I uh, carefully looked at one of these studies that said, for example, that calcium gluconate is better than calcium carbonate, done in a bunch of young women, there were some of those women which the calcium carbonate was absorbed better than that. They're just very close together. They're very similar. And it's not worth the extra money. Is calcium carbonate, is that like Tums? Tums are calcium carbonate. Lousy antacid, great calcium source. Yeah. Okay, low protein uh, diet arrests kidney failure in diabetics. People with diabetes have kidney failure. And as we, we noticed that the protein causes stress to the kidney, we said, what can we do? Will it help people with diabetes to protect their kidneys to remove the protein? Uh, so here's what we did. Uh, what you're looking at here, and I'll try to explain this, this is done over a year's time. We have people with diabetes whose... Uh, Creatinine clearance, now that's how much blood can be cleaned by the kidneys in one minute. Normal is about 80 to 120 cc's per minute. That's how much our kidneys clean from our blood. 
When you get down to 10, then it's time to have dialysis. So that kind of gives you this, the, the, the range here. These pe people have diabetes. They started out normal, and, and we found that uh, the, their average creatinine clearance was at 50 cc's per minute, or milliliters per minute. Then we changed their diet to a low animal protein diet and watched them over the next year. And voila, it stopped getting worse. It stayed where it was. So stopping the animal protein seemed to protect the diabetic's kidney. The next slide is uh, the same group of people. When a kidney is not doing well, it is spilling protein into the urine. Look at here. The urine protein, 3,000, zero. Zero is closer to normal. When we get to 2,000, we say that's nephrotic syndrome. That kind of, kind of a little milestone for us doctors. This group of patients was spilling two grams of protein, or 2,000 milligrams, a day in their urine. After being put on the low animal protein diet, it dropped at the end of a year to 100, back down to the normal range. So these kidneys were now filtering better. That's good news. The lower animal protein diet tends to help the kidneys. Now, I, have, I can no longer find it, but several years ago I found a study. I thought it was in my files, and I haven't been able to find it, so don't ask me for it where they did this similar type of a thing and, and put one group of people, left one group on the high protein diet, put one group on the low protein diet, and the third group they put on high protein but plant protein only. That is, they stopped the animal protein and moved them to uh, plant, stopped the animal protein moved them to plant protein. And the people that moved to plant protein had the very same protection as those that went to the low animal protein diet. Probably because of those organic acids we talked about and the protection which they bring. Now, you might not be surprised. Uh, it makes sense that if there's less protein going out in the urine of these diabetics, that the protein that stayed in the blood might go up. And indeed, it does. When the protein in the blood, this uh, albumin, gets low, people's risk of dying and a heart attack and all, congestive heart failure all goes up. So we like the fact that it went up. It tells us the whole body is doing better. Okay, I think we're getting pretty close to our last slide. This one is done in humans. People were put on a diet to lower their cholesterol. Okay, the goal, lower cholesterol. And we want to know if there's a difference between animal protein or not animal protein. So the, one is skim milk. One group, they both get the same diet. One gets skim milk, and the other gets soy milk. This uh, goes for three weeks for this first section. Those that got the soy milk had their cholesterol drop nicely. Those, because this diet was supposed to do that, those with the skim milk had their cholesterol drop, but not as well. After three weeks, they were switched from one to the other. This one on uh, skim milk was then switched to soy milk, and look what happens to the cholesterol. These folks on soy milk were put back on skim milk, and their cholesterol came up. So there's a significant effect of animal proteins. It negatively affects your heart attack risk via this uh, whole cholesterol picture. Well, we've been on a journey. And uh, if, if you folks, if some of you have been, uh, how do we say, if, if you've been committed to this whole business of uh, eating muscle in order to get enough protein, this has probably been rather uncomfortable for you. Okay? And I apologize for that. I, I generally tell people, you know, you don't have to become a vegetarian in order to be healthy but you do need to eat a plant-based diet. You don't have to stop eating meat. You just need to eat lots of fruits and vegetables. You need to be using your animal products as a condiment. If you do that, the plants will help protect you against the negative effects. Yes, ma'am? You didn't touch fish. I didn't touch fish. Fish is another muscle. It has the same amount of cholesterol and the same protein as other muscle. It all works the same. Yes. What about the people that go to a vegan diet, but that, let's start to use a lot of animal meat? 
What about people that use a lot of analog meats? That's an excellent question. If you take the soy protein and refine it and turn it into, have you heard of TVP, textured vegetable protein? The effect on the bones and the acid environment is the same as meat. Because you've taken away the organic acids, the plant. The more we refine it, the worse it gets. So it's better to eat food the way, closer to the way God made it. Now, now I, we use those, uh, I happen to be, uh, to ascribe to closer to 100% plant-based diet. But I will have some of those analogs on occasion, but they're like Thanksgiving, and it's a holiday sort of a food. It's not something I have every day. The beans are a much better way to go. Anybody else with a question? This goes back to the beginning, and I was sort of curious. The PRISM study was uh, establishing a certain criteria. Uh, uh -huh, the, what did the World Health Organization, where did they arrive with their 37, and where did the government arrive with their 60, just theoretically? Well, there's a bit of a theoretic to it. Uh, remember, they started out very high, and they've kind of been lowering it ever since. Uh, when you set government policy, especially in this country, there's an awful lot of industry involved with it, okay? So uh, th that is a very strong in influence. You can see the World Health Organization is, cares a lot more about kind of overall health, growing children, and, and people under stress. And they're saying, you know, if we're handling people that are really starving, 37, there's not enough protein to go around, 37 is, will do it. And that's what our goal is. Dr. Rose is getting down all the way down to that two and a half percent. It's on the edge. If you're getting that much protein, will you actually get enough of the essential amino acids? I mean, those are kind of questions. So they, they kind of shot at it with their best. I don't know that there's any science that proves which one is which. Except we started high and we've been lowering it ever since. Okay. Good question. Yes. If, you, if you'll use your, your animal products as a condiment, better to have beans with some ground beef in it than to have the steak, right? That would be a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> My question is about calcium. When I have 40, my doctor recommends me to have uh, extra calcium. And then he said that even though I'm very healthy because I'm slim, I have more tendency to have osteoporosis and heavier food. She says... Uh, she, she turned 40 and her doctor said, you have to take calcium because you're thin and thin women are more likely to have osteoporosis. Yes, this is one of those places where being fat is a benefit, okay? I don't particularly, uh, and, and it really has to do with the muscle because when you're heavy, every time you move, you exercise. You're lifting weights, if you will. So, so that increased muscle helps to make the, actually helps to make more calcium and make the bones stronger. <clears throat> now, if you're going to take calcium for your osteoporosis prevention, please make sure you get magnesium with it. Because you need half as much magnesium as you get calcium. If you have 1,200 milligrams of calcium, take 600 milligrams of magnesium. Because it's an important part of the bone stuff. And the doctors don't, the nutritionists know, but the doctors don't know. So we're, we're still trying to help to educate them on that. And if you eat plant-based, you don't need nearly as much calcium. You don't really need to worry about it. Exercise, yes. Vitamin D and sunshine, yes. Okay. What about vitamin B12? What about vitamin B12? No, meat, cows do not make B12. B12 is made by bacteria. And there's bacteria in the cow's stomach, which makes B12. And there's bacteria in our stomach which make B12. We just need to get the bacteria into our mouth at the right time, in the right way, or the B12 from the bacteria. So you don't have to get it from meat. The truth is it's not absorbed very well from meat anyhow. There are a lot more people out there with vitamin B12 deficiency who are meat eaters than there are vegans who eat no animal products. So that's not... 
if, if you have any question, you just take a B12 supplement. Yes? Are there some cross-cultural studies that analyze the amount of protein a given uh, society consumes? Yes. Correlate, correlate that with yes. the amount of disease, diseases? Yes, there are. And maybe you've seen those slides. I, I imagine that's why you're asking about that. I didn't include them here. They're actually considered low-quality evidence. And, and I haven't included them. I showed you more kind of practical type studies rather than, but yes, the more fruits and vegetables, the stronger the bones, the fewer the fractures. The more milk and dairy, the more fractures from that standpoint, yes. If you lose your ovaries because estrogen helps to keep the bones strong, then what about, uh, what about calcium? Yes. Well, if you lose your ovaries, taking as much calcium as you could won't keep you from losing the uh, calcium out of your bones, okay? It, it just doesn't work that way. You have to, some people are really funny with this. Uh, calcium must be wonderful. Maybe you've seen some of this stuff on the Internet that tells you how wonderful calcium is. I had a patient come into the office. He was probably 70, 75 years of age, and he said, Doc, what do you think about this? It was one of these Internet things, you know. And he said, the, the, as I looked at it, this person was recommending like 8, 10, 12 grams of calcium a day. And I said, you know, I don't think that's a good idea. I, I don't think I should, you would, should do that. Well, he said, I'm going to do it. He was back about six weeks later. <clears throat> so constipated. He had a plaster of Paris cast of his colon. <clears throat> we liked and never got it out. <laughs> You know, if a little is good, a lot is better. No, you don't need nearly that much. <laughs> so don't go overboard, okay? I don't mind 12 or 1,500 milligrams. You're not going to get in trouble. Take the magnesium with it, better. If you have a, a lot of calcium without magnesium, you're more likely to make spurs, like the heel spur and the shoulder spur and those types of things. So that's not a, a good way to go. Okay. The side effects of a high-protein meal? The side effects of a high protein meal? How does it make you feel? I, when you have a high protein meal, people tend not to get hungry. It's quite satiating, interestingly enough. Uh, I think fat does more of the clogging of the brain, and if it's a high animal protein, there's going to be fat kind of with it. Um, did you have something in, in mind? I kind of blame that on the fat more than the protein. Like the Atkins diet, yeah, that's, that's the, more the absence of carbohydrates rather than the presence of protein. Certainly your body is more acidotic. I've seen this, and you can do this. You know the litmus paper? Uh, uh, do the litmus paper on your saliva if you're a meat eater, and it'll show acid. Eat plants for a week or so, and then repeat it, and it'll turn alkaline. Urine, the same thing. Your whole body turns more alkaline when you eat plants, and that alkalinity is actually much better for your health. The acid tends to increase inflammation, which is associated with increased risk of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. So animal products tend to uh, push us towards the disease process. Plants tend to pull us away from disease process. Yeah, I have to ask you this question, Doc. You there was an awful lot of energy there. I, 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 it was something that had to go. No, I haven't. That's a little bit scary. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what it would do to the stomach. Um, I know it's quite active chemically, and it can create heat when it gets, you know, with water. I, I'm not sure I would recommend that. I, I think there's probably a better way. Okay, one last hand, and then we're going to let you go. You all have been here long enough. I just have, I hope this is a simple question. If it's not, just disregard it. But why do most Afghans... Oh, my. <laughs> well, that's kind of hard in the last two minutes. Uh, it, and it doesn't, it doesn't really fit. Um, I can tell you that caffeine will increase, coffee, caffeine increases uh, osteoporosis. There's a negative effect from that. I can tell you that um, caffeine or, or coffee will raise your cholesterol level. I can tell you that. And it's not the caffeine. And it's not the caffeine. Okay. 
Well, <clears throat> you've wasted another perfectly good evening <laughs> taking charge of your health. It's been a pleasure having you here. Class dismissed. I'll be around for a while and we'll answer questions.